Dinosaurs and their integuments, whether it be on their bodies or on their face, was wide-ranging among different genera, and only really in the last 40 years has more knowledge on them and how they function been understood, ranging from filaments to hornlets and rugose facial scales. Their extent and their purpose has been through a good amount of discussion, and recently, this has been most prevalent and vocal in regards to lips or the lack thereof in dinosaurs, though mainly on theropods as I'll be focusing on. Fraught with debates, if you've been around enough paleontology circles, you'll have surely heard the lip debates pop up a few times, and if you haven't, well, it's time to strap in, because it's been a wild ride. The discussion surrounds the application of lips, in this case, extraoral tissues, which has throughout the field's history touched on virtually all other fossil vertebrate groups, which has been a major focus with dinosaurs, drawing a large amount of attention, often so in the media for how animals like Tyrannosaurus in particular would have appeared. Its basic components cover the question of whether living dinosaur relatives, crocodiles and avian dinosaurs, birds, give compelling or misleading insights for dinosaur facial reconstruction, as well as the importance of the respective tooth size and angles, and how they would have been covered, not to mention all of the wide-ranging differences and similarities of jaw morphology between varying reptile groups. For all of this, and the often explosive and long-winded arguments, the question of lips in dinosaurs has received little attention from actual dinosaur researchers, with much of what we know and understand on the matter coming from paleoartists, social media posts by scientists, or blog posts, which are still in their own right important and well sourced. Their merits, however, lack when detailed scientific studies on the matter are low in number, and a lot of what had spread through paleoarts and in general paleo circles is more down to popular culture and opinion, the reasonings of influential paleoartists and or art memes, so a more rigorous look into the matter was important to delve into. Enter a recent study published in Science which is dedicated to answering this very issue, setting out to determine if dinosaurs, in this case looking at theropods, particularly Tyrannosaurus, had extraoral tissues. To clear some things up before going more into the study and its findings, it's worth going over what kind of lips are suggested for dinosaurs to clear some things up, and also as to what they would have been like if they did have them when compared to their living relatives. Living tetrapods, with all the diversity, even the semi-aquatic to fully aquatic ones, all have some form of tissue covering their teeth, with some exceptions here and there in a few groups, though this is mainly down to specialised lifestyles and diets, like has been seen in river dolphins and living crocodilians. Mammal lips are quite unique in being mobile with a good amount of muscle attachments, which, given all of their intricacies, often obscures the features of a given mammal's skull quite considerably because of this. Reptiles do have lips like mammals do, but these are pretty different structurally, given the amount of time separating them and their divergence. Lepidosaurs, which includes lizards and snakes, have something more accurately referred to as labial scales, which is in the same place as mammal lips, obscuring their teeth, but function pretty differently. They're not as mobile, don't obscure their overall skull shape too much, and more so just function as a way to seal the mouth, a straightforward and simple function, and, when it comes to discussion on dinosaur lips, it's the ones in Lepidosaurs and their relatives which are looked to, given the convergences on display, as will be got into. As an aside, lips and lip dinosaurs in this case is mainly used as a catch-all general term, even if their function is different compared to mammals where the term is most often used. Crocodilians and birds, the closest relatives of non-avian dinosaurs, have often been looked to as a good comparison to them given their closer relation to them, birds especially given their descendants of them. Where issues arise in looking to them for comparison is how their facial tissue compares, since they do differ in a few ways. Birds, while having a rictus at the base of their beaks, possess, well, beaks, keratinized ones which are not structured in the same manner as their non-avian theropod relatives. With living crocodilians, they are well adapted to and specialised to an aquatic lifestyle, and show quite divergent anatomy when it comes to how their jaws interlock and function, with them being quite the derived group of reptiles themselves being an outlier amongst much of their extinct relatives in their skull features, so them lacking extensive oral tissue comes down to a range of other factors not seen in non-avian dinosaurs. Arguments against extra oral tissue is largely predicated on not just the close relation of these two modern groups to non-avian dinosaurs, but also with how theropod teeth and jaws appear. Large theropods have occasionally been reconstructed without lips, mainly in Tyrannosaurus as seen in Jurassic Park because of the apparent enormous size of their teeth compared to their jaw size, and because of this, lips would not have been capable of covering them. In a few cases, this has often been down to people not realising that a lot of the teeth we see in theropod skulls are slipped out of their sockets, exposing the roots, leading to some pretty glaring issues in reconstruction. Though, besides that error, theropod teeth, even when restored correctly and are accounting for tooth slippage, do indeed have very large teeth compared to those of other reptiles. Instead, it's best instead to focus on the estimates of their crown heights when they are fully socketed in their mouths. Getting into the study, it's set out in the first case out of four investigations to calculate the ratio of the tooth crown heights compared to the skull length, 
for 37 theropods and comparing the same metric with 40 varanids, the monitor lizards, having very large serrated teeth, alongside a copious amount of not only lip tissue, but gum tissue as well. What was found was that theropods and varanids' teeth were actually pretty comparable in terms of the size of the teeth compared to their skull size, and even increased in proportion at the same rate as they grew. Some monitor species, like the crocodile monitor, have comparatively really large dentitions and still manage to have them covered by both their lips and gums. So from this, it seems clear that theropods did not need unprecedentedly big lips at all to cover and seal their mouths. In terms of the proportions, monitors are able to cover their teeth with the same basic configuration of labial and gingival tissues across a 12-fold size difference, and given the discrepancy between the largest monitor and theropod skull is only half that at 6 folds, even with more conservative lippage, which is more supported by the authors anyway, would still be consistent with most other lepedosaurs, leading to a similar result regardless. As another point, to get the jaws to shut, it's very difficult to near impossible to seal some theropod mouths without lips, especially so in Tyrannosaurus. Some have hypothesised that the mandibles could be pulled up into the cavity of the upper jaw, with potential landmarks for the resting position of the lower teeth being identified where they could sock it in. Though others have questioned this idea on the basis that theropod mandibles can't properly close without literally running into problems. At a certain point of closure, theropod lower jaws were found to collide with the bones under the eye sockets, specifically the ectopterygoids, with any further reduction either requiring the jaws to crush themselves shut or the other bones of the posterior skull acting as a hinge, though with the consequence of dislocating the jaw joint. It's been proposed by Tracy Fors, one of the more notable advocates for lipless theropods, that a notch in the ectopterygoids could have accommodated the closed lower jaw. Though it's not thought possible by the researchers involved in the paper, and Ford's other arguments featuring tooth slippage and other errors are otherwise not worth paying too much attention to. Theropods ectopterygoids can have complex shapes and do seem to superficially indicate that they could neatly lessen the lower jaw, though these, based on other correlates, were almost certainly filled by jaw muscles in life. There are some theropod skulls which are preserved with the tightly shut jaws found in the fossil records, but considering the distortions that often occur in the fossilization process and how decay and geological conditions can affect them, can push the bones into unnatural conditions not seen in life. Scans and x-rays of lizard carcasses have found that their jaws were far from being clenched tightly even with their mouths closed, and, in some species, the lower and upper dentition hardly overlaps. When plotted reasonably to theropods, their lips would have been deep and the snouts being much taller than what we're used to seeing, and given how the neutral position for most other tetrapods is similar, this tracks well for lips being likely. When it comes to their faces, examining the foramina, which function as passageways for blood vessels into their jaw and face, with them nourishing and providing resources to extraoral tissue and for sensory purposes. Crocodiles today have scattered foramina across their faces, which in their case, helps more so with sensory inputs and detecting vibrations in the water, which is quite the contrast to a lot of their extinct relatives. A key example of this was brought up in the paper with Hesperosuchus, a crocodilomorph from the late Triassic, whose foramina, like that seen in lepidosaurs and theropods, are lined up evenly along their jaw, which is quite different to modern crocodiles where they have hundreds of evenly distributed foramina across their skulls. Their teeth, being xiphodont in shape, having serrations on their current edge, as well as being laterally compressed, also differs quite a bit from living crocodilians, which are rounded and conical. Because of this, as well as comparisons to other lepedosaurs, which show the same distribution pattern, it tracks in that Hesperosuchus, like them, would have also had some more extensive oral tissue, and since this is also seen in theropods, it tracks for them as well. Some of these observations regarding the significance of the jawbone foramina to the lip question has long been recognised as far back as the 80s with Robert Bakker, and especially recently with Thomas Carr, who has been among the most ardent and consistent proponents of lipless theropods, who himself compared tyrannosaur jaw surfaces to those of crocodilians, something the authors of the discussed paper don't think are alike at all, especially in their distribution. In both lizards and theropod dinosaurs, the teeth are also aligned with the vertical plane of the skull and do not lean outwards as in extant crocodiles. Carr is also on record with assuming that the thick and mobile facial anatomy of living archosaurs was ancestral to the whole group, given both living representatives like them. But as has been established, these two lines of animals have been shown to in fact be outliers for varying reasons as has been established, and that oral tissue and a lip condition similar to lepidosaurs on a few levels was ancestral to archosaurs as a whole, and was instead lost independently. A new piece of evidence down to the power of the lipped argument is something brought up in the paper by comparing the enamel and the tooth wear on them. Enamel is one of the hardest tissues, and, because of that, is incredibly resistant to damage, though said resistance is very dependent on moisture. 
Hydrated enamel is more plastic, which allows it to become more resilient to abrasion than enamel that is dehydrated, which is prone to being brittle and cracking under strain. Because of this, having lips assist in most animals for maintaining the health of their teeth over having them exposed, and to further examine how theropods compare to crocodiles who keep their teeth out in the open, it's worth worth taking a closer look at their respective structures. To do this, a comparative histological analysis of the tooth wear patterns of both the Tyrannosaurus and Crocodilian tooth were examined, with an upper tooth from the Tyrannosaur Despletosaurus being examined for both its age and the enamel structure from a histological thin section. The thin section confirms that the tooth was fully developed, with it being consistent with the tooth development and replacement rates of over a year that has been estimated in other large Tyrannosaurids like T. rex, with the enamel being found to have a similar thickness on both sides of the tooth with no evidence of substantial wear, even though it was over a year old as an estimated 510 days, as well as dinosaur enamel being very thin in comparison to crocodiles. In contrast, the enamel of an alligator tooth used from the same tooth position was heavily eroded on the exposed labial side, with even a good portion of the dentine occasionally being worn away, which is almost certainly influenced by their aquatic habits and the teeth being exposed. If the Despletosaurus tooth was permanently exposed, the tooth used should have shown, even minimally, a similar amount of decayed enamel and denting being exposed at the tips. Adult Tyrannosaurids, being the primary representatives of the lipless model, are even more relevant here, since they replace the teeth at a pretty slow rate, oftentimes biennially, and engaged in very intensive bone feeding strategies, and so if any theropods were to have said abraded teeth, it would be them, but it's just not seen to the extent that you'd think. To explain this, the most likely and reasonable explanation would be that the teeth were existing under hydrated conditions to better maintain their teeth, and that would mean the presence of extra oral tissues of some form. An argument brought up that since crocodiles shed their teeth as well as dinosaurs, it's would track them that dinosaurs would have also been lipless to accommodate this, even though most lizards and snakes also do so, making this point pretty moot. Teeth that can be shed still need to be kept in good condition while they're around for an animal to function their habitat properly, especially terrestrially, and given how theropods differ from crocodiles and where they lived and how specialised crocodiles are, it's worth clearing up. With all this said, from tooth size, jaw structure, tooth wear, and capability of jaw closing, theropod jaws, from what we know, only really make sense anatomically if they had lips of some sort. In order to give validation to the alternative and less likely lipless model, requires a lot of reaching and abstraction which is not easy to come by, whether that be for the new evidence providers on the wear patterns of the teeth, how the foramina occur between taxa, and how theropods would have had to be unique amongst almost all tetrapods for not having an oral seal for their mouths. With this paper out, it may well in the future establish more intrigue into the oral tissues of other extinct animals, ranging from Gorgonopsians, Euintotheus, or Thalicus mylus, and also into Spinosaurus, especially among theropods, what with their superficially crocodile-like snouts and splayed teeth at the front of their mouths. Given how comparatively easy of a test it is to conduct, it's certainly worth looking into more. Issues with the paper, such as only testing one theropod tooth without a control, have been raised, as well as more osteological correlates that could have been brought up as well. The more in-depth research and information in the future can almost certainly clear more of this up. And overall, it is a high-quality paper, not that I disagree with its conclusions. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whatever that may be.